Okay, so last week we started our February series, and uh, if you were here, you'll know that we had a little bit of conversation about how to have more fun, about discharging loyal soldiers, and also about choosing which life, thief life or Jesus life. If you missed it, then just go onto the LBC uh, webpage and you'll find links there for the podcast or the YouTube video if you like. But in case you missed it, or in case your week has been very full and you think I was here, but I'm not sure I can recall quite what happened in that space, I want to give you just a two-sentence reminder of what we said about the two lives that Jesus talks about out of this parable. So first there is the life that the thief offers. Remember that? And we described the thief's purpose as to quietly take. He's not a smash on your door and break in and demand your stuff with menace type thief. He's sneaky. The thief takes precious things from our life which basically we're not guarding, and effectively surrender to him. And then with the result that our lives are sometimes ruined in dramatic and obvious ways, and sometimes, maybe even worse, just wasted in something that is mediocre. And then there is the Jesus life. And Jesus' purpose, we said, or we, from what the words that he wrote there or were recorded there that he spoke, Jesus' purpose is to give us a now and forever gift of a vibrant and vital, dynamic life that blows mediocre out of the water, goes way beyond what we often settle for, even as, even as followers of Jesus. Okay. And last week I said that this week... Um, we we got to a point where we looked at the choice between the two and I said this week I'm going to unpack for you a little bit more the characteristics of the Jesus life and I hope that for those of you who've already chosen that life that this will be helpful, maybe a reminder and an encouragement and for those of you who haven't yet chosen between the two or are maybe even trying to decide is there a choice? Is there actually the choice that Jesus offers? Then I hope that you will find this helpful as we look at the the markers, the characteristics of what what the Jesus life is like. Okay. The series is based in John 10. I'm sure you've gotten onto that. And so I just want to start again by reading the short little parable. It's only about five verses that Jesus tells. And this week I want to read it to you in the message version, just to give you a different take on it. You know, if you hear the same bits over and over, it's easy to go, yeah, I know how that goes. So John uh, chapter 10, verses 1 to 5, the story Jesus tells. Let me set this before you as plainly as I can, he said. If a person climbs over or through the fence of a sheep pen, instead of going through the gate, you know he is up to no good. He's a sheep rustler. The shepherd walks right up to the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him, and the sheep recognize his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he gets them all out, he he leads them and they follow him because they are familiar with his voice. They won't follow a stranger's voice, but will scatter because they aren't used to the sound of it. Now, we said last week that Jesus told this story because in the chapter before, the artificial line of the chapter, this is actually life just going on, People were debating and arguing about who he was. So he he tells this story by way of explaining to the people who he was. But at the end of the parable, most people are none the wiser. I think the next line there says something to the effect that they had no idea what he was talking about. (laughs) So Jesus sets about explaining what his story of the sheep and the shepherds and the thieves meant. And in chapter 10, um, if you had a look at your, do you want more with that sheep from last week? We alerted you to that In that document, in chapter 10, in three places, he explains this parable. Three different places in that chapter, and he does it in a slightly different way. And I think that it's in these explanations that we can see the characteristics of what choosing a Jesus life would look like. So we're going to have a quick look at those three explanations and and extrapolate out of there about half a dozen characteristics of the Jesus life, and you might want to jot those down as as we go through. Okay, so the first explanation we did read last week, but I've got it on the screen there, and uh, let's just read it through again. Hopefully it's getting familiar to you. So he explained it to them. This is the first time he he tries to explain this parable. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep, said Jesus. All who come before me were thieves, or who came before me, were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not listen to them. Remember, he was talking about the leaders of his time. Yes, I am the gate. 
Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So I think that the first thing we can see from this first explanation is that Jesus is saying, choosing the life that I give, choosing the Jesus life, means you are going to live much more certain of the path to travel because you live in the company of the one who is the way and is the keeper of the way, who is the gate and is the, is the keeper of the gate. Now, I'd love to be able to tell you and it would make preaching and pastoring and Christian life so much easier if I could tell you. So if you just acknowledge Jesus as the gate and the way, then your life will let, be laid out before you. You'll see it. People are smiling over there, slightly hysterical smiles, possibly. You, you know, you'll see it all laid out and you'll go, oh my goodness, that's great. He's the gatekeeper. I can see the plan before me. But I can't tell you that because that's not what happens. And time and again, the stories that we read in the Bible, the stories you hear from other people, the stories of your own life, show that, in fact, when we acknowledge Jesus as the way and trust him with our uh, guarding our coming and going, we oftentimes only get enough sense of that next step. Hey? When the sheep come out of the gate, the shepherd doesn't sit them down and say, right, here's the GPS or the map, and we're going here, and there should be grass there, and there'll be water there. He says, follow me, step out of the gate. It was uh, just over 16 years ago, can you believe, that I uh, started having a series of conversations with um, a small group of appointed people from LBC and then ended up with a formal interview about the possibility of coming here to pastor. I was still studying at theological college and I was a teacher, I was teaching part-time, and in my mind's eye, the plan that I could see was that I was going to pursue an academic um, career from that point in, in theology. At first I thought I might teach teachers, but you know, a bit of a change of plan and an academic career in theology. So teaching pastors um, as they train to be pastors. Now the principal of the Theo College was very encouraging of me pursuing an academic path, but he was also very wise and he said, the thing is, if you're going to teach pastors how to be pastors, you probably should know something about being a pastor. Isn't it annoying when you sit in workshops or lectures and somebody um, delivers a lecture and you think, have you ever done that? <laughs> I mean, I've been a pastor's child and a pastor's wife for many years, but yeah, he had a really good point. So I said, sure, that's a good idea. I'll do my study and I'll also uh, see if I can find some place to get some experience pastoring. And at the time, I started conversations just in baby stages with three churches. And two of them were really close to where I lived, would not have required us moving house. And uh, that made sense to me in my future, where, which was at the Bentley Theological College campus, which was quite close to our home, seemed to make good sense to me. And I have to say that those two that were close were actually quite exciting, and I would have said easy options for me to pick up for a variety of reasons. I can tell you about that off camera later. <laughs> And again, this seemed to work for me, actually. Not that I'm into easy as such, but I thought if my, my path is academic, then some place where I can relatively easily get some experience just seemed to make good, good sense. And yet LBC was the church I felt God was asking me to step towards. The one who was watching over my coming and going said, step this way, but it's not what I want to do long term, I said. Step this way. But we've still got two kids at home, you know, adult kids now, young adult kids, and we'll have to move house, and I'm sure if we move house, one of them at least will move out earlier than they would have otherwise. This was quite a long story I had with Jesus. And, uh, I, you know, I said that to him, and he said, step this way. But they might not vote for a woman at Les Murdy Baptist, I said, whereas I know without a doubt the other two would. Step this way, he said. And in the end because I believed that Jesus, my shepherd, was guarding my coming and my going, I took that next step that didn't actually make sense to me in many ways. And LBC and the wider community became the good pastures that Jesus was leading me to for this season. No regret. No regret. You know, when we choose the Jesus life, we live more certain of the path to travel one step at a time because we live with Jesus, who is the way and the keeper of the way. Jesus is God himself guarding our coming and going. 
And the psalmist says, the Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. And Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. So that's the first thing about the Jesus life. We'll go through the others a little faster, I promise. Second thing, when you choose the Jesus life, I think you will find that you will live less alone because you are uh, living in the company of one whose voice you know. Jesus actually talks about this one in all three of his explanations. You'll see him refer to this in verses 8, 16 and 27. Okay, a little bit of more background. We're learning a lot about shepherds in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, the, the, the good shepherds led. They did not drive. It's probably still true where shepherding is practised. They led their flocks into and out from their pens. They led them towards food and water and away from danger. And remarkably, they used their own voices to do that. I think that's quite extraordinary, maybe because I'm more of a city girl than a rural girl. I think that's amazing. And sometimes it wasn't necessarily just their voice. They would get into the habit of um, taking a, a very rudimentary instrument with them, a little short wooden flute, and playing a repetitive tune. And in a sense, that repetitive tune became the voice of the shepherd, and the, the sheep would follow whenever they heard that tune. Uh, when my first grandchild was born, I sang her a version of Twinkle Star that, just in the spur of the moment one day, she was you know, a couple of weeks old, that had ma made up words in it, different words in it. So it, it's got a line in that says, Grandma wonders who you are. And another line in it that says, you are like a diamond in Grandma's sky. And uh, it was just one of those things that happened, but it became a thing in our family. You know, in my own family of origin, it was a clean pressed handkerchief of my dad's that was the symbol of comfort. And that would be pressed into your hand or put into your backpack or slipped under your pillow at times when you needed to know that you were loved and secure and somebody was there for you and had your back. In, in my grandchildren's generation, it's become, not on purpose, but this Twinkle Star song. And, you know, I've sung it to all the grandchildren now, but so have their mums and some of their dads, not all of them. <laughs> not that they're not into it, but they're not into the singing bit. And they've sung it, you know, over their children or to their children when they've been ill or distressed. And when our youngest grandchild was in neonatal ICU and we couldn't hold her for quite a period of time, I would sing it over the cot. And I heard her dad sing it over the cot as well. And it was, it was you could see the tangible comfort when those familiar words were sung in familiar voice to that little girl. It was like a hug. Now God has always spoken, sung, talked to his people through angels and burning bushes, through the law, through the prophets, through kings, through priests. But he has never sung over us, spoken so intimately to us as he has in Jesus. Jesus is the voice of God. And when you choose the Jesus life, you will live less alone, even in the tough places, because you live in the company of one whose voice you know. The choosing the Jesus life, we see in this first little explanation, also means you will live less worried about tomorrow because you will be in the care of the one who provides for your needs. Okay, I want you to do a little experiment in your head for a minute. Can you think, conjure up in your head uh, an image that you might have seen uh, of shepherding? You know, if, if you put it into a search engine, shepherding, what sort of image comes up in your mind? Have you got a picture in your head? I'm going to assume it's like the one that comes up in my mind and like the one that ones, many ones that came up when I did actually uh, Google it in the week. The pictures you often see, if you type in shepherding, are pictures of ruggedly handsome older men or ruggedly handsome younger men, like think firefighter's calendar. <laughs> Just saying, hi doll. <laughs> and, and they're invariably holding fluffy white lambs, hey? And there's rolling green hills in the background. And uh, you know, if you, if you look really close, you'll probably see some butterflies and bunnies and birds. But in reality, the shepherding life in Jesus' time was much less, you know, the rolling green hills of home and much more outback desert Australia, if you can get that image in your heads. Where Jesus lived, pastures were often rocky, barren hillsides. They weren't green fields. They were desert areas. 
And at night time, the shepherds would gather their sheep into pens that they made. Uh, they, they built them up to about waist height out of rock. They, if they could, they would back them up against a cliff face or a pile of rocks or at the end of a canyon, so there was a bit of protection there. And they would use nature's barbed wire, thorny bushes, to put that on top of the, the stones that they'd stacked up there. Where Jesus lived, shepherds moved their flocks not across green mowing pasture-type lawns, but they moved their flocks amongst the uh, rocky ground, around the rocky ground, looking for little places where tufts of grass had, had grown up in the crevices of rocks where a bit of dew might have collected. One tuft here, one tuft there. Let's move over here. Where Jesus lived, the limestone hills did not absorb rainwater. And so when rain came, the shepherds had to find safe places for their sheep to drink. They couldn't just let them rush down to the water that they could see because it was quite likely that the sheep would be washed away by violent floods that came with the rains as the water raced through the canyons. Okay? So when Jesus is talking about the shepherd as good, he's not talking about the shepherd as an okay bloke who looks quite cool and, you know, is going to save you if you need saving, in that sort of hero type way. He's talking about a person who is noble, devoted, courageous and vigilant. Being a shepherd was not taking a cut lunch and sheep on a nature walk. The desert is a desperate place and the shepherd's job was severe, tiring and hazardous. Choosing the life, the Jesus life, means living in the care of one who is noble, devoted, courageous, vigilant, and who will provide for your needs, even in the desert. Okay, there's just a few more characteristics of the Jesus life I want to look at now, and two of them come from this second explanation that he gives. He says in verses 11 to 16, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand, so he introduces a different image here, a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, said Jesus. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. And this, we're going to look at this next week, but I've got to put it in here as a teaser now. Jesus says, I have other sheep too. Hmm. One's not in this fold. They are not in the sheepfold. <laughs> I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. We're not going to spend time in that space today, but we will look to it next week. So I think what we can see here, what we can learn about choosing the Jesus life and what it means here, is that you will actually live less afraid because you will live in the company of one who will protect you even at the cost of his own life. Now, Jesus introduces the hired hand in this section, and the hired hand isn't to be paralleled with the thief. The thief is out and out evil. The hired hand is just a little bit slack, and like probably most of us. He's happy if he's paid to look after Sean's sheep. <laughs> but if a wolf tries to... Uh, that's quite funny, there's a show about that, yeah. Uh, if the, the wolf comes to attack Sean's sheep, the hired hand's out of there. He's not going to risk getting killed for the you know, measly 20 bucks an hour he's getting to watch Sean's sheep for him. It's dangerous and he's getting out of there. And Jesus introduced this idea of the hired hand to highlight something else about the good shepherd. The good, which remember means noble, courageous, vigilant shepherd, will go out to face the danger threatening the sheep and if it needs be, he will take the fate that would otherwise be for the sheep. Hired hand won't do that. The noble shepherd will. And a little later, in another section in chapter 10, Jesus makes it very clear that as the good shepherd, he willingly and freely goes out to face the danger that threatens us. He says in verse 18, No one can take my life from me. This is Jesus speaking. I sacrifice it voluntarily. 
for I have the authority to lay it down and, <laughs> joy upon joy for us, I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. The thief comes to steal life, the precious things we're not guarding. The hired hand won't be seen for the dust if there's any hint of danger, but Jesus, the courageous shepherd, is willing and able to lay down his life and in a beautiful pre-echo of his resurrection. He just drops into the to the explanation here. It's in my power to lay my life down, which is wonderful, wonderful to have someone who will lay their life down for you. But I think probably even more extraordinary, it's in my power to take my life back up again. And I'll do that for you as well. So choosing the Jesus life means living less afraid because you live in the company of one who will protect you even at the cost of his own life and he has power over death. Another thing, choosing the Jesus life. It means you're going to live freer from anxiety. There will always be anxiety while we live on this earth, I know, but significantly freer from anxiety because you will be in the care of one who pays attention, who knows what's happening in your life and your head and your thoughts. When I was a kid, uh, probably when I was in early high school, actually, my siblings were younger than me, we had a number of wonderful holidays at a farm down south, a sheep farm. Colin and Helen owned that farm. And we learned all sorts of things in our holidays on that farm. We learned, um, we learned how to ride a motorbike. That was pretty cool. We learned where lamb chops came from, which was less cool. He made us watch a... Anyway, it's probably good for us. But we also observed Colin, and he, he loved to teach, uh, do things to protect his sheep. So he said to us that he had to keep an eye out in the springtime particularly for the flies around his sheep, because if he didn't watch that and do something to protect them if they became an issue, the flies would, would get into the, sh the sheep's eyes and ears and, and nose and anywhere where they could find a, a place to be, and they would breed, and uh, the, the, the little worms would come out and they would itch the sheep and drive the sheep Totally, totally insane, really. He said sheep will actually kill themselves against a tree or a fence post, smashing their bodies and their heads just to relieve the terrible itching that, that happened. So he kept a watch out. He knew what was going on. He knew if the flies were becoming an issue. He knew if there was something he needed to do to protect his sheep. And I want to say to you that if you choose the Jesus life, you will be freer from anxiety because you are living with a good shepherd who pays attention, knows what's happening on the outside and the inside, pays attention to that. Okay, we're nearly done. There's one more section, though, in chapter 10, where Jesus explains some more about what his parable means, and I want to read that to you now. It starts at verse 25. Jesus replied, we'll get back to what he was talking about to others in, in weeks to come. Jesus replied, I've already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my Father's name. But you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. So choosing the Jesus life means living more secure because no one can snatch you away from Jesus who is one with God. And no one takes from God what God has taken to himself. Isaiah recorded these words, From eternity to eternity I am God. No one can snatch anyone out of my hand. No one can undo what I have done. Nobody takes from God what God has taken to himself. Jesus is God. They are one. You know, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to take these characteristics, these half a dozen characteristics of, of the Jesus life, and we're going to look at how that plays out in our everyday lives. I don't want to rush into that space as we come to a close this morning. I want to land us back at the choice space where we landed last week. Thief life, 
or Jesus' life? The life Jesus has come to give means less uncertainty. It means less loneliness, less worry, less anxiety. It means ultimate safety. It means living without fear of death. And it is a life that cannot be taken from you. It's liberty to live beyond what you might otherwise simply settle for. So which life will you choose?